welcome everyone. Welcome to the Mary Baker Eddy Library and to our program on spiritual intersections in Boston history. I'm Jonathan Eder, programs producer here at the library, and um, also I'm a, la a lifelong Bostonian. So I approach the whole subject of intersections with a great deal of caution. Um, <laughs> So I'm hoping that uh, spiritual intersections prove to be a little bit easier than uh, some of the other intersections we have to deal with in our fair city. But, um, but I'm still very glad to be able to turn the proceedings over to someone else to facilitate and guide us and negotiate us through, uh, to, through spiritual intersections in Boston history, uh, specifically during the, um, the late 19th century. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Christopher Evans of the Boston University School of Theology. Uh, professor Evans is um, professor of the history of Christianity, or is it Christianity and Methodist Studies? Uh, history of Christianity. History yeah. of Christianity and, and, and Methodist, Methodist Studies. And Methodist Studies. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I've gotten to know Chris over the last year or so. Um, he, uh, he approached us here at the library to see if we could be a venue for his class on the religious history of Boston. So we've been delighted to welcome that class uh, two years now, and some of those students are, are with us here in, in the audience. So um, it's a privilege to, uh, to work with you, Chris, and it's a privilege to have uh, this association with the Boston University School of Theology. So I will turn it over to, to you, Chris, and. Um, Hopefully we can get safely through this intersection. Thank, uh, thank you. We have a big task in less than an hour, Jonathan, but I want to I wanna extend a word of thank you uh, to, to Jonathan for just the, the wonderful work, not only in terms of the last two years of facilitating our class, but providing, I think, a unique forum to, to bring together a group of scholars to talk about this topic of the spiritual intersection of Boston, looking at the larger importance of religion in Boston as, as it developed, particularly in terms of today's topic in, in the latter part of the 19th century, when Mary Baker Eddy would have been very much a part of the, of the religious scene of the city. The, the presentations, and I will introduce the panelists first, and. Uh, I will introduce them in, the, in terms of the order that they're going to be presenting. Our first present presenter this afternoon is Dr. Peggy Bendroff, who is the executive director of the Congregational Library, one of many great uh, archives, research centers in the city of Boston. Uh, Peggy is a historian who specializes in a variety of different aspects of American religious history. Her books include Fundamentalism and Gender, and a book that uh, we've actually used for our Religious History of Boston course, Fundamentalist in the City, Conflicts and Division in Boston's Churches. Our second <coughs> presenter uh, to my left is Dr. James O'Toole, who is the Clo Millennium Professor in History at Boston College. Uh, Dr. O'Toole is the author and editor of several books, including The Faithful, A History of Catholics in America, and also, Habits of Devotion, Catholic Religious Practice in 20th Century America. Our final speaker, uh, batting cleanup, so to speak, in good baseball term with uh, opening day just a few weeks away now, is Judy Henneke, who is the Senior Research Archivist uh, at the Mary Baker Eddy Library here in Boston. Uh, I have to say a special word of thanks to Judy because over the course of the last couple of times that we've, we've come here, and particularly when I was here for the first time last year, Judy introduced me to just the, the treasure trove of, of the collection here at the library. And, and again, Judy, you're a tremendous resource in terms of the work that you do here at the Mary Baker Eddy Library. And so we will begin our conversation this afternoon with, with Dr. Bendroff. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. And I assume that um, you can all hear me and pretty much see me. Uh, oh, good. Even someone in the back. I'm going to um, be talking about Protestants. And I'm going to begin with a story, a uh, story a little later than our time period. It's the winter of 1916. And the city of Boston is a buzz. Billy Sunday the famous baseball evangelist is in town. 
And he, when an evangelist came to town back in the old days, they were there for months. He arrived in mid-November. He was there through January. But night after night, he filled this giant tabernacle that they built for him just over the way in Huntington Avenue, kind of where the Y is today. Uh, tens of thousands of mostly middle class churchgoers um, who never seem to get tired of hearing him, or really, um, in the case of Billy Sunday, seeing him. He was um, famous because he didn't just preach against sin and the devil, he wrestled them on stage and you know broke chairs and all these other kind of wonderful things. This time was special because every December, the city of Boston held a vote on local option, the number of liquor licenses to be granted. Um, and back then, liquor licenses were uh, like something that you would put in your will. They were, they were dear. Um, they were passed from father to son. I think that one was valued at $19,000. And um, the city's business community actually took out full page ads. They figured they were going to lose somewhere around $1.4 million if um, Billy Sunday had his way. They had good reason to be nervous. You know, Billy had taken on the license vote, and he devoted much of his fiery oratory against the liquor trade. The Boston Evening Transcript has a wonderful description of Billy. He said he grabbed the saloon, threw it in the air, turned it inside out, walloped it, stood it on its head, threw it down, and trampled it into a shapeless mass. On the eve of the election, he gave um, his most famous anti drink sermon, his prohibition sermon. It was called Get on the Water Wagon. Um, and it was for men only. So it was a little bit exciting. Um, and as he was dripping with sweat giving this talk, he called nine boys onto the platform. And he waved a giant American flag over their heads. And he cried, this is the raw material of the saloon. Are we going to pay our taxes in boys? And of course, you know, no, never. And hundreds and of trail hitters, as they were called, surged down this sawdust trail to shake Billy's hand and swear off alcohol. But when the election was held, the wet forces won by a huge margin, even bigger than the one the year before. Why? Because almost none of those weeping trail hitters so worried about vice in the city of Boston actually lived there. Boston had become, as one observer put it, a fringe of piety surrounding the Irish. So, <laughs> he, gets, he gets the last word on this. Uh, uh, and so in here, herein lies our tale. And it's a story that reached its most dramatic moments during the 19th the 1880s as Mary Baker Eddy was settling into Boston. It's about evangelical Protestants trying to save the city and its inhabitants, and also about their failure to do so, obviously. Um, and about a, uh, well, I mean, from, okay, uh, a process of gradual spiritual alienation and really a pattern of lasting ambivalence towards American urban culture among evangelicals. So first, who are these people? They're not the Protestants that we usually imagine, you know, the elegant inhabitants of the Back Bay and Beacon Hill, um, the Boston Brahmins. These, are, these evangelicals, we would call them middling sorts, mostly white Methodists, Baptists, Congregationalists, a scattering of Presbyterians, Reformed Episcopalians, as they call themselves, uh, and on goes the list. We might describe them in the late 19th century way as broadly evangelical. It's different from what it is now. Uh, that is its very general definition. Generally orthodox on matters of the Bible's inspiration and authority, the necessity of faith in Jesus for salvation, and the importance of making the world in some fashion a better place. OK, they are badly outnumbered, or at least they appear to be. According to the census of 1890, when Boston's population stood around 450,000, about 185,000 of those belonged to a Catholic parish. And of course, Catholic parish was everybody who lived there. The, the Protestant numbers, you had, you, know, you had actually sign up for church members. But even so, 12,000 Baptists, 10,000 Congregationalists, 5,000 Methodists. Even the Unitarians didn't crack 10,000. So this, again, says little about what was, who was you know, the, the church pews on Sunday morning, um, but it's an indication. 
And the numbers really aren't all. They were also being crowded out politically, and they would say morally. Um, and here we return to the issue of alcohol. Nothing galvanized evangelical Protestants during this time than saloons and drink. Uh, not for health reasons. This is morality, and of course we can. Um, uh, there's a long story behind that, but it's you know packed with um, emotion. How can they stop drinking in the city of Boston? Two important groups of Bostonians stood in their way, and they were banding together in an alliance of what one historian has called Harvard and the slums. The first group were the back, Beacon Hill and the Back Bay, who liked their after-dinner sherries and fine wines. The second group were the city's Irish Catholics, um, who knew from experience that there was nothing to be gained by giving free reign to uh, Protestants in any form. <laughs> the alliance was publicly sealed in 1885 when Hugh O'Brien became the city's first Irish Catholic mayor, elected, as they said, one of the better sort, um, who courted the Blue Bloods, and of course the Boston Public Library is part of his legacy here. Our drink-hating, increasingly beleaguered evangelical Protestants had two options. One was increasingly aggressive evangelism, what pa Baptist pastor A.J. Gordon called the unchurched masses. There are 380,000 people in Boston, he said in 1885 in a sermon, of whom not more than 50,000 attend church on the Lord's Day. I don't know how he knew this. Uh, but it was time for the city's evangelicals to go outside their doors and try to win them back. Um, who those, uh, I would imagine most of those unchurched masses were probably Catholic immigrants, but you know, they never really talked about that. Um, Gordon's church members became part of a systematic effort during that time to win the city. They went house to house in the South End. This is a time of open air preaching and of course the common, the parks, the beaches, the urban neighborhoods, and two of, uh, and two of downtown Boston's signal churches, Park Street and Tremont Temple are part of this effort. Okay, so the other option was to get mad. The 1880s saw the rise of a virulent anti-Catholic movement led by evangelical Protestants. This is nothing new for Boston. The tensions go way back. But this was close to being an organized movement with a full plate of conspiracy theories, its own political agenda, and it was driven by women. You know, by the 1880s, women could vote in school board uh, elections. And we think of that as a lovely ladylike thing to do, but it was not. Um, uh, that, you know, uh, school board elections in Boston are always a little fraught. And at this time, uh, they were hot and heavy over small things like, you know, the school was too close to a saloon, the textbook said something bad about Catholics or too much about Martin Luther and all this kind of stuff. Um, evangelical women organized, they had held rallies, they went door to door, and they found a champion an escaped nun, as they called her, named Margaret Shepherd. Well, actually, here's where my story ends, uh, a second tale. Um, Margaret Shepherd turned out to be the pin that took the air out of their movement. She was wonderful on the platform. She could tell those lurid tales of what the priests were really doing in the confessionals and so forth. Um, but it turned out um, that someone in Chicago uh, found out what she was doing in Boston, and uh, well, it was revealed that she had not one but two husbands, one in Chicago and the other uh, in, on the East Coast. And she, it was, the story was told that she had been overheard talking to someone else and saying, I'm just in this for the money. So Margaret's downfall delighted some Bostonians, of course, and it was the fatal blow to others. You know, my time is getting short, but let's just say by the 1890s, anti-Catholic fervor, like many of these kind of rabble-rousing things in American culture, simply runs it, its course and goes underground for a while. Uh, people get sick of it, and Boston was on its way to becoming a 20th century city. Um, why is this important? Uh, you know, we could go on and on about this, but I, I think these stories about evangelicals in Boston are important uh, because we see their pattern developing of people, you know, evangelicals today are people who um, denounce American society, you know, sin and up one side, down the other, but they also love it more than anybody else. You know, this American society as um, both Jerusalem and Babylon, as one 
um, historian has put it, this deep ambivalence among evangelicals about the culture that they think they're trying to save. And in many ways, nothing demonstrates that better than the wonderful, fabulous, uh, eccentric people that um, lived in Boston in the 1880s. Thank you, Peg. Thank you. Uh, well, by the 1880s, as, uh, as Peggy has suggested, Boston is on its way to becoming one of the most Catholic cities in the, in the country. Um, that's an unlikely development <clears throat> in the long uh, line of, uh, of Boston history, beginning in the, in the 1630s. Um, Boston is founded uh, by, uh, by uh, English Puritans um, uh, to be uh, a deliberately non-Catholic, even anti-Catholic place, a place for English Puritans to escape uh, from the popish uh, influences that they still found in the, uh, in, in the Church of England. Uh, so um, um, opposition to Catholicism religiously and otherwise is really built into the DNA of Boston <clears throat> from, the, from the very beginning. In the 17th century, there's a succession of wonderful uh, so-called anti-priest laws, or uh, in some cases called anti-Jesuit laws. I point this out to my Jesuit colleagues at Boston College uh, all the time. <clears throat> um, if, um, the, the law said that, that if you were a, uh, a priest, uh, you were a traitor and a subversive by definition. Um, simply, that's, that's what you were. And if you came to Massachusetts, you'd be thrown out of the country. Uh, uh, if you were shipwrecked, you had a, 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 a few days uh, to get out of the colony. Uh, if you came back to the colony, you could be uh, put in jail and, uh, and exiled again. And if you came back a third time, you could be hanged. Um, these laws were never uh, enforced. Uh, but I've no doubt that uh, the original Puritan settlers would have enforced them. There were similar laws against Quakers. And as we know, there were several Quakers who were hanged on Boston Common for violating the, these laws. So, um, as I say, from those beginnings, it's very unlikely, or seems very unlikely, that Boston would have become such a Catholic center in the 19th century as, as it did. There was a small Catholic community in the city. By the time of the American Revolution, the first Catholic parish uh, is opened in 1789, the same year George Washington became president. Um, and uh, it, uh, Boston gets its first bishop in 1808. <clears throat> and builds uh, the, what is still the current cathedral of the Holy Cross on, on Washington Street. You can see it on the map uh, here, uh, just a few blocks away in 1875, right on the, the verge of the, uh, of the period that, that we're talking about. By then, the story of Catholics in Boston is a story of immigration and a population explosion based on uh, immigration. <clears throat> Immigrants in this period primarily from Ireland, but also from Germany, uh, and in subsequent decades from other parts of, of Europe as well, uh, Italy, um, Eastern Europe, uh, and, and so on. So the fact of life for Catholic Boston by the end of the 19th century is this population exp explosion, and how the institution of the church is going to have to grow just to accommodate those thousands of, of uh, people uh, uh, who are moving uh, to, to Boston. Some data points. In 1885, there are 31 parishes, Catholic parishes, in the city of Boston. Uh, the Catholic parish is defined as a unit of territory. Uh, and uh, there's a, uh, you could lay a, a grid on the city of where these 31 uh, parishes uh, are. There are about 130 in the rest of Massachusetts uh, by, by that time, um, including uh, up in Lowell and Lawrence, Cambridge, uh, and, uh, and other cities. <clears throat> uh, at this point, there are also the origins of a real Catholic infrastructure beyond the local parish church. Schools, hospitals, orphanages, uh, social welfare institutions of, of all kinds, all being built, all going up in many cases, it seems, overnight because of this, of this uh, population explosion. Catholic leaders are really just trying to keep up uh, with, the, with the people who are coming in. 1885, 31 parishes. 1900, 15 years later, half again as many. 
uh, parishes, 44 parishes uh, now, um, about 300 priests, about 40,000 students in Catholic schools by the, by the turn of the century. In that, just that 15-year window, you can see uh, this, this uh, population uh, growing um, uh, beyond anyone's uh, imagination. Also at this time, the, there's a little bit of a change in the nature of the Catholic parish. The, the geographical um, basis of, of parishes remains largely the same. If you live in this street, you're a member of this parish, and that's the church you go to. If you live in this neighborhood, this is your parish church. But also by the end of the 19th century, there's a, there's a second grid that is sort of overlaid on top of this, which is based on ethnicity. Um, because so many of the, the, the overwhelming majority of these parishes are, uh, the people are largely Irish, what happens when large numbers of Italians or Germans or French Canadians or others start moving into their, that neighborhood? Those people want to hear sermons in their own language. The Catholic Mass, I should say at this time, is, is conducted entirely in Latin a language uniformly foreign to everybody. Um, <laughs> but it's a question of, it's a question of sermons. Um, it's a question of what language will be used in the school. And also, it's a question of what language par parishioners can use when they go to confession. Uh, can they talk to their priest in confession uh, in the language that they're both, both most comfortable with? And so for that, there's a second ethnic or so-called language uh, grid of parishes that are, that's laid down on top of the geographical one. So that if you are a Lithuanian, no matter where you live in the city, you can go to this Lithuanian church, which only further complicates uh, the, the Catholic infrastructure uh, on, on the ground. Um, uh, by 1900, uh, Catholics, as, as Peggy said, are, are um, um, coming to dominate the city politically. Uh, and uh, this Catholic infrastructure really, uh, really made that, that possible. Let me conclude with one uh, note about interreligious activity and feeling uh, in this era. This era that we're talking about um, is one in which members of one church, no matter what it is, are not inclined to look favorably on the members of another church. Uh, I think this is one of the hardest things for early 21st century people such as ourselves uh, to understand. Um, that if you were a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist, you were convinced that your approach to faith, your approach to religion, was the right one. And anyone else's was simply wrong. End of, end of discussion. But what's more, you really shouldn't let them be wrong. Um, uh, th there's something wrong with them that they're wrong because, after all, this is important stuff, right? Uh, so it, it seems to suggest a kind of indifference if uh, you say, well, I'll believe what I want and, uh, and you believe what, uh, what, what you want. That's not the kind of attitude <clears throat> that people, certainly Catholics in this period, but I think members of all churches uh, at the end of the 19th century would have, um, uh, would have shared this, this kind of attitude. And as a result, it seems to me, the members of any one denomination don't pay an awful lot of attention uh, to the, the members of other denominations, except uh, to be convinced that they are in, in fact wrong and therefore are to be avoided. So any kind of interreligious cooperation, uh, again, which seems perfectly normal and good uh, to us, would have, been, would have been out of the question uh, at, at that time. Um, uh, if you read the popular Catholic press in Boston and, and elsewhere uh, at, at this time, there are wonderful denunciations of Mary Baker Eddy, uh, who, uh, who, you know, is just, just couldn't be more wrong as far as the Catholic population uh, is, uh, is concerned. And I think that's an important, um, because it is so different from, uh, from I think, the world, uh, the mental world most of us live in today, uh, I think as setting the context uh, for our period, uh, that's an important reminder. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What he says is so interesting. And, and as I listen to the amazing history that both Jim and Peggy have given us, I'm really struck that Mary Baker Eddy's path to Boston, that is, 
the path the Christian Science Church took to get to Boston was very different. And in fact, you're going to hear about a little cooperation even. It begins, in fact, a little north of Boston. Lynn, Massachusetts is where things began, though of course it's not all that far from Boston. Here Eddie lived for a number of years, and it was in Lynn that she and her fellow Christian scientists, then an extremely small group, first gave a month of church services in June of 1875, a few months before the publication of Eddie's book, Science and Health. Now it was a little more than three years later, in late 1878, that a regular series of services began in rented quarters on Sunday afternoons. Eddie still lived in Lynn, but she had decided to have services not on her home turf, but in Boston's South End. The building, interestingly enough, was at the corner of Shamit Avenue and what was then called Madison Street. Near the edge of the South End, in fact, I finally figured it out today, it's about where the corner of Shamit and Melnia Cass Boulevard are. Um, so the building's completely gone. It was at that time a defunct Baptist tabernacle and was rented out to Unitarians. The Unitarians rented the vestry to the Christian scientists on Sunday afternoons. Um, that building later became 12th Baptist Church and I think was quite a well-known building in Boston history. It, I believe it is now demolished. Now we know it, the titles of a few of Eddie's sermons from that time period. Uh, one she delivered in December 1878 was The Bible Teaches Us How to Heal the Sick. In a chatty letter about a month later, she wrote to her student Clara Choate, who lived in the South End, I wish you could have been at the meeting at the Tabernacle last Sunday. My subject was Christ's coming, and I did twist the cords and make a lash for their backs that cut smoothly, I assure you. And as soon as I was done, three rows for questions. I answered and beat them every time. <laughs> One of them said he was satisfied. The others had reason to be, for the audience cheered me, clapped, and stamped, and the clergyman told them he should not have that, and commenced saying that I was as dark as a beetle on some points. And I went to reply to the clergyman, but he kept on, and the audience called out, let her speak, etc. I have lectured in parlors 14 years. God calls me now to go before the people in a wider sense. I should think it strange if we can do no better than pay so high in Salem when we can get a better hall in Boston for five or six dollars per day. So it sounds like Eddie had discovered that she could get better crowds and pay less in Boston. So perhaps it wasn't too surprising that Boston soon became a center for her activities. There was no actual church at the beginning, but by the spring of 1879, the beginnings of an organization were in place. The church was small, though, and continued to hold services in various rented quarters in the city. Now, as I said, services were held on Sunday afternoons, and I think there were several reasons for this. Clearly, availability and cost were factors, but I think Eddie was also perhaps trying to send a message that her church was not necessarily focused on drawing good men and women away from the evangelical churches. So uh, Eddie left Lynn and settled in Boston in the spring of 1882. And she was in the South End at 569 Columbus Avenue, which I think is on the map there. The building housed her living quarters, as well as space for her classes in Christian science healing. Regular meetings were held there, too. They were then called parlor lectures. But the space by this time was not large enough for the now three-year-old church services. Eddie, as author, speaker, and teacher, was becoming well-known to Boston audiences. She was seen by some as a kind of autocrat, in complete control of every aspect of her church and classes. But that is far from the case. I found that in these early days, Eddie was, regular, was not the one to preach a sermon every week. The pulpit, it seems, was regularly <coughs> supplied by a stream of generally Unitarian ministers. Cyrus Bartol who was the well-known transcendentalist, and Andrew Preston Peabody, who was associated for decades with Harvard, were among the distinguished clergy who preached at the Sunday afternoon services. I've seen some summaries of their sermons, and these men do not seem to have made any attempt to preach Christian science theology, though they apparently sympathized with Eddie and felt her teachings should not be suppressed. <coughs> 
So Eddie was likely trying to gain respectability for her church, and it probably didn't hurt the attendance to engage some well-known ministers as her backups. Even in this early period, the Boston transcript was advising readers to come early to secure a seat, especially when Eddie was preaching. So the entertainment factor can't be denied. But that brings us to Eddie's first major speech before the Boston public, which was in early 1885. Eddie was now an established presence in the South End. But on February 25th of that year, a nasty letter about Christian science was read by Joseph Cook at one of his Monday lectures at Boston's Tremont Temple. Now, Joseph Cook was not a minister, although he had trained to be one. He was a professional speaker, and he was also a national celebrity. Perhaps, uh, if I can say, the 1880s equivalent of a commentator on Fox News. <laughs> he was once described by a New York paper as large, heavy, sometimes unpleasantly intense a man in all ways physically massive and intellectually vehement. He had a very strict organization to his lecture programs. A prelude was followed by an interlude that often included questions and answers. The majority of the 90-minute program would then be taken up with an address, and that is Cook's own lecture. He made sure there was plenty of time for that. He covered religious, scientific, and political topics of the day. Now, you'll be interested to know that the letter read by Cook was not written by him, but by a well-known and quite conservative local minister, whom we will also heard about, A.J. Gordon, and most likely reflected Cook's as well as Gordon's views. The two were longtime colleagues in the management of these Monday lectures. Cook had a strong interest in reconciling scientific discoveries with evangelical Christianity, and Gordon was deeply committed to the revival of Christian healing practices. Yet both could only reject Christian science and in no uncertain terms. With some difficulty, Eddie was able to secure time to respond to the letter at Tremont Temple. And this was quite an opportunity, as the Monday lectures were often summarized in newspapers and magazines, not only in Boston, but nationwide. So Eddie was given 10 minutes probably most of the interlude portion of the program, to give her response to the Gordon letter. Not surprisingly, she took a cue from the typical interlude format, and her response was formed as a succinct, yet effective series of questions and answers about Christian science. While her response to Gordon and Cook was met with total silence by the audience, it evidently generated great interest. A few weeks later, on Easter, Hawthorne Hall, which was on Beacon Hill, was filled an hour before the beginning of the service in anticipation of Eddie's sermon on the text, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Still, though, the services remained on Sunday afternoons, and Eddie continued to invite clergy to study in her classes free of charge. In fact, it wasn't until June of 1889 a little over 10 years after the modest beginnings in the South End, that the Christian scientists in Boston began to hold Sunday morning services. And by then, Eddie had already preached her last sermon in Chickering Hall and had moved away from the city to Concord, New Hampshire. The growth of her church and the building of the two structures right outside the doors here would take place after that while she lived out of state. So we can call that the next chapter in the story, and we'll cover that in our next program. <laughs> in just a few minutes, I want to open it up to the floor for some questions for our panelists. As a way to, to, to perhaps get the conversation going, one of the things that struck me that certainly runs through the presentation is, is the importance of the South End to the larger history of re religion in Boston. And for all of the ways, and Peggy, I know you really point, out, point this out in your book, Fundamentalist in the City, the, the way in which Boston, uh, so much in terms of the city is defined by physical space, in terms of religion, in terms of social class, uh, ethnicity, 
But the South End, for, for all of the ways that this was seen as the Catholic part of Boston, it was such a meeting place of diverse religious groups, other types of Protestant churches, you, you had spiritualist associations. I guess what I would be interested to hear from, from the panelists is why the South End? Why is that such an interesting meeting place in terms of, of, of the fact that even though you have the situation, as you said, Jim, where there's, there's a lot of animosity and hostility among different groups, but, but by the same token, you have so many different religious groups taking up residence in this part of the city. Why is the South End so historically important to that? I, I would say partly that um, the rest of the city <laughs> wasn't. I mean, they, Beacon Hill and Back Bay, you know, the Baptists did a survey of the Back Bay hoping that they would, you know, find out how many Baptists there were. There were like six. You know, they're all Unitarians and Episcopalians, so they published a survey anyway. I don't know why, but um, uh, but the South End, I think, at this time was also where people came. The new people came because there it was boarding houses and you know all that other kind of um, uh, housing for you know single people. If you've ever read the book *The Rise of Silas Lapham*. <laughs> He's in the South End just as it, the, it turns unfashionable and everyone moves to the Back Bay. So, you know. He sees a man in his shirt sleeves. Oh, a man in his shirt sleeves, yeah. So, you know, there's that, that's part of it. The other dimension I'd point out about the South End, I think, is that um, uh, until the end of the 19th century, the South End is new land. Uh, it's newly filled in land. Um, uh, so it's a brand new neighborhood that is just opening up, uh, and and I think that that draws people into it. That means development there is uh, is very rapid. It does not become as fashionable as uh, as the Back Bay, and I think that allows for um, the um, uh, the uh, proliferation of all different kinds of housing stock, rooming houses, uh, and so on. From the Catholic perspective, then. This is cheap housing. Um, it's, uh, it's in the middle of the city, so it's probably close to, to work uh, for these people. And I think that's why the, the Catholic um, uh, population moves in, in that direction. At the same time, Catholics are moving to other parts of the city as well, which become overwhelmingly uh, Catholic neighborhoods, many of them uh, the so-called streetcar suburbs. Uh, that um, scholars have, have written about, some of which are eventually incorporated into the city uh, politically. So South Boston, Dorchester, <clears throat> until uh, the Second World War, War, Roxbury is an overwhelmingly Irish uh, and, and, uh, and Catholic neighborhood. Uh, so uh, Catholics are really clustering uh, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these kinds of, of neighborhoods. The example I always give to uh, students is um, uh, Dorchester Avenue. <clears throat> Dorchester Avenue is a long street that goes from the Milton Line uh, with Boston uh, right up into the heart of the South End. Um, from, um, um, from one end to the other, Dorchester Avenue is maybe, maybe four miles long. It might be five miles long. Uh, by the 1940s, if you drove those four miles uh, of Dorchester Avenue, you would pass through eight Catholic parishes. Um, that's a measure uh, of the density of the population and the size of the population uh, that, that we're talking about. Um. As far as Mary Baker Eddy living in the South End, I think it's just what Jim was saying. and. Uh, she found a place that she liked, and it was at the price that she needed coming from Lynn. Um, wh whereas the services began at that Shamit Baptist Tabernacle that was kind of on the edge of the South End, she quickly started uh, renting rooms in places that were not actually in the South End. And a lot of the places where she held services were closer to Beacon Hill than they were to where she lived on Columbus Avenue. It's interesting, though, um, since we mentioned the Shamit Baptist Tabernacle, where she had services for about six months or so, uh, that turned out to be a building that was um, owned by an amazing number of different churches. Uh, as I mentioned, the Baptists, the Unitarians. Um, it eventually came into the hands of the Disciples of Christ. Um, 
uh, two Jewish congregations and eventually uh, became the 12th Baptist Church. So I think perhaps that's kind of the measure of the changes that were taking place in that neighborhood just, and this is, we're talking about uh, 1873 to 1906, 33 years. Hey, I get the sense that that's very common uh, in the South End, that you have a lot of turnover in terms of uh, religious property going from one group to another. Theology is one thing, real estate is another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. when it comes to money, there is there are no dividing lines. Yeah. Well, some of these Protestant churches failed, you know, they were great guns, like Gordon's church was bordering the South End. It was like this, one of the, the leading uh, churches uh, in Boston. He died, and within 10 years, it's, you know, on its last legs, there was a, a huge um, uh, congregational Broadway tabernacle, or it was a tabernacle. Uh, it was a, not just a church, it was like uh, teaching, you know, rooms for education and childcare and bowling and all this kind of stuff. Within, you know, 10 years, it just went completely vaporized. So it just was dependent on uh, back in those days, a lot of um, personality of the minister and people's personal loyalty to him. And so, you know, that only lasts until they're, while they're alive, so obviously. There, there's been a lot of literature, and obviously it's a, it's a very contentious and, and troubling part of Boston's history, but the, 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 the kind of racial tensions, and particularly when you look at uh, the tensions historically between uh, Irish Catholics and African Americans. I, I'd be interested to hear, when, when you look at not just the African American population of Boston at this time, but the, the fact that by the 1880s, you're seeing an influx of Jewish immigration to the city. How, how did the Jewish population of the city interact with some of these groups? As I follow Jim's, not at all that I could tell. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the best study of this, I think, uh, was done maybe 15 years ago um, by um, a, uh, I think he was a political scientist, act actually, who wrote a book, um, the, the subtitle of which uh, speaks to the issue at hand, uh, Why the Jews Left Boston and the Catholics Remained. Uh, and his, his central insight, I think, bears on, on this question. And that is, in uh, the, the Jewish understanding of the temple, the synagogue, is it's where the people are. Uh, and if the people move, the synagogue will move with them. Uh, and he gives his, his best example is um, um, what is uh, still a very large and active uh, congregation today, um, uh, Temple Mishkan Tefillah, which is in Newton, uh, just a mile or so from, from Boston College. Started out in the South End, moved to several different uh, other places in the South End, and by the 1950s had moved, um, uh, moved first to Roxbury, uh, then I think maybe to Mattapan, and finally in the 1950s to Newton. The point is, when the people moved, the, the temple moved with them. Um, whereas this structure of Catholic parishes, based on geography, linked to the neighborhood, it was always there. Uh, it didn't move. Successive generations of people moved through it, but, but it was fixed. And, and uh, the point of the study was that that, that left Catholics um, entrenched in the city, uh, in city neighborhoods, identifying with city neighborhoods, so that when African Americans moved in, that's where the, that's where the point of, uh, of conflict was. Um, again, you can see this per uh, particularly, um, I think, uh, maybe not in the South End, but in Dorchester. Until fairly recently, um, uh, and to some extent even, even today, if you ask a, a native of Dorchester, someone whose family has lived there for generation, uh, generations, if you ask them where they live, they won't say, I live in Dorchester. They'll say, I live in St. Mark's. I live in St. Brendan's. Uh, I live in St. Gregory's. Uh, the, the parish church has come to characterize the neighborhood, and, and it's that embedding uh, uh, of, the, of the Catholics in the neighborhood that I think set up this, uh, this tension when other groups uh, moved in. And uh, of course, the, the school desegregation um, crises of the 1970s are the, are the best example of, of that. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I live in Norwalk. The people well, I work with do the same thing. Uh -huh. If I ask my boss where she lives, 
That's exactly what she yeah. said. Of course, I have no idea where that is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. I, no, I, it's true of other cities as well. I think this gentleman's com comment is a good cue for us to, to open it up for questions from, from the audience. I don't want to think that the religious establishment is AWOL from all this uh, period, but I, not too much has been said so far about, say, Unitarians and Episcopalians and and at least part of the Congregationalist world. Would anybody like to comment on their role at this time in Boston's history, either in relation to the South End or just more generally? Well, I mean, I think that these are, I think they're obviously the civic leaders. They are um, in the public school controversy, the, um, the voice of tolerance were, uh, were leading Unitarians and some Episcopalians. And so they, they do, you know, they, they're small. I mean, Episcopalians actually are the largest denomination in Boston. I was always, Protestant denomination, but I was always surprised at that. Um, but it's not size, it's influence. You know, obviously Harvard and the whole intellectual establishment is Unitarian. Um, but it's really interesting to see them playing that role already um, uh, of, come on, you, you're both being intolerant and we need to find a way um, through this. I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, it's a huge important part of the story. And, you know, the, um, the, the stereotype of Boston during the late 19th century, you know, is all these swamis and the, yeah, theosophists and <laughs> spiritualists and seance all in the back bay. And yes, they were here. Um, and people maybe uh, were a little more adventurous um, religiously here uh, if they were, you know, a little fairly sophisticated people were pretty adventurous and believed some surprising things. But you know, in some ways, I, I, this is a deeply conservative city religiously. You know, kind of what Jim said, the parishes are there. Um, it's old. I mean, the Congregationalists, the Baptists, their churches are, you know, two, almost three centuries old by the 1880s. You know, they're, they're kind of here to stay, and they're not terribly worried about, you know, the next new craze, they, or, or, you know, that it's going to, it's going to, you know, ruin us. It, it's interesting, the congregational uh, Suffolk County ministers, Suffolk Association of Ministers, you know, in the Boston area, they'd meet and they, they, they took minutes of this one meeting, they discussed Mary Baker Eddy, you know, this new thing that was happening in the minutes, it says, the matter promises to be short-lived. <laughs> <laughs> so they said, so don't worry about it, you know. So. What, what you're saying too, Peggy, I, I, a few years ago I was looking at some uh, microfilm of the Boston papers around the time that Phillips Brooks died in 1893. And everything in the Boston, it's like the world stopped when Phillips Brooks died. So I, I think it reflects the fact that even though their numbers were small, that a lot of what we would probably call today mainline Protestant churches had, they, they exercised a great deal of cultural capital despite their relatively small numbers. I have a couple of quick questions, I think. Uh, was that in sudden influx of uh, Irish immigrants due to the potato famine? And was it Boston because that was the closest, closer than New York or whatever? And the other question? Yes, uh, immigration to Boston, especially Irish immigration, comes in successive waves. Uh, the uh, failure of the potato crop, the potato famine in Ireland in the 1840s, in the 1840s, is the first uh, major rush. Uh, there's a hiatus during the Civil War, uh, and then immigration from Ireland uh, picks up again after the Civil War. But by that time, there are larger numbers of um, uh, Germans, East Europeans, and, and others as well. Uh, the Irish will always numerically predominate, and, and that, that uh, uh, even though there are these other groups. And that makes Boston a little different from other uh, Catholic centers around the country, where there's a little more parity uh, among the ethnic groups. A place like Chicago, for example, uh, Irish and Germans and East Europeans are more, are more even uh, 
Uh, here, the Irish are, are so predominant, it, it creates a little different um, um, uh, situation. Oh, thank you. And the other question, uh, the synagogue follows the people. Why did the Jews leave Boston for Newton? I mean, it's close by, but... Yeah, it was, uh, it was uh, economic opportunity. It was the succession of generations. Uh, the children do a little better than the parents, and so they want to move from the city itself uh, to a leafier kind of suburb. Uh, so it, it's, um, it, you see the phenomenon, especially over the succession of, of generations. Judy, you had mentioned that um, because Mary Baker Eddy was putting the, her services early on in the afternoon that it might be an indication that she wasn't trying to compete to pull people away from their original faith. Um, but I'm curious what the, um, kind of, did she see her followers then as kind of embracing both, you know, could you be Catholic and Christian scientist at that point? You know, kind of, well, what is well, she kind of thinking because, about that? Uh, in her statements at the time, she wasn't really pushing for church membership so much as simply having her services out there, having her classes and of course having her publications available, not just her own publications, but also the periodicals that the uh, church began putting out in the 1880s. So uh, the whole idea of church membership as being kind of a commitment to Christian science is something that again comes in 1889, about the time that she herself decides to leave Boston. It's not something that seems to be quite as prevalent in the period before that. So she's kind of seeing this as something that you can embrace along with your original faith tradition or whatever. I, I think she's kind of seeing it out of necessity because that seems to be the path that so many are taking. Um, with all these different ways of thinking uh, sort of coming together and fomenting in one area in Boston especially, a very populous area, how do you think it has changed? How do you think it uh, helped? What good did it do to Boston in the long term? That is a great question. <laughs> Christian science is just being a, a really tiny slice of the pie. We have to remember, too, when we're talking about these numbers, um, if maybe there were only uh, six Baptists in Back Bay. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that the number of Christian scientists was a whole lot larger than that. <laughs> so in some ways, the influence uh, may not be so much by the, the churches and the services so much as, as maybe even the publications of the Christian Science Publishing Society, such as, of course, the, the Christian Science Monitor. I would, I would say um, for Protestants, you really need to look at it over the long haul. and. What all of these um, Protestants, the evangelicals and the Unitarians and Episcopal Episcopalians too, in a sense, what they all inherited from their Puritan roots was this deep sense of um, civic responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so these, um, you know, they, we ne may not approve of their liquor politics, but this was how they, you know, the church was not just a holy club and we're all saved. It was to make the city of Boston a better place. And that, um, that ideal of the John Winthrop and the city on hill, I think it's had a profound influence on um, New England culture, but also Boston um, in you know, good ways and bad ways. Yeah. I'd say something of the same applies uh, from the Catholic uh, side, side of things. By the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Catholics are coming into political power <clears throat> in, in Boston. That's the age of uh, Honey Fitz, uh, President Kennedy's grandfather, and James Michael Curley, and so on. Um, not always the most edifying uh, of, uh, of, of politics. But the, the, the leader of the Catholic uh, uh, diocese at the time is Cardinal William O'Connell. Uh, whom I studied um, uh, some, some years ago. And, and when O'Connell becomes the archbishop, he has this, um, this he gives this sermon, and, and the aphorism in it is uh, to describe the changes in Boston. The Puritan has passed. The Catholic remains. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and I think, I think he meant that in two different senses. One was the pure numbers and political power. 
Puritans, Congregationalists, they used to have the political power. They don't anymore. Catholics have it. But I think the other side of that for O'Connell was it's a way, it was a way for him to say not just, now it's our turn. I think he was also saying, now it's our, the Catholic he meant, now it's our responsibility. Uh, and so the, the uh, enforcement of public standards, public morality, um, uh, which you know, can lead to all kinds of things, censoring the movies and indecent literature and, and so on. I think, I think um, um, O'Connell was expressing this sense that that responsibility broadly m moral, not narrowly denominationally religious, that was now something that the Catholic Church had to, had to take on. And I think that, that guided uh, his, his uh, view. More practically, I think, in terms of enduring um, impact from, from the Catholic side, is this infrastructure of schools, hospitals, social welfare agencies uh, that, uh, that um, uh, uh, were built uh, in this period, many of which uh, still, still exist. Um, um, you know, Kearney Hospital in South Boston, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in, uh, in Brighton, uh, Catholic Charities, uh, all those kinds of agencies. I think that's a, that's a which, which are now, of course, uh, not just for Catholics, but, but for the community uh, as, as a whole. Uh, in the, the uh, Catholic schools in, uh, in Roxbury and, and Dor Dorchester, most of them, uh, have Catholic minorities uh, in the in, in terms of the actual uh, population. I knew the pastor of one of those uh, of, of a par parish in uh, Dorchester several years ago, uh, and and he said, "Oh yeah, all my all my best altar boys are Buddhists," <laughs> uh, which is a way of expressing what was what was happening in the neighborhood. So it, it's that enduring uh, infrastructure, I think, where where the Catholic um, influence remained. I, I was interested, Jim, by your comment about uh, the, the way that that statement, the period in this past, the Catholic remains, yeah. how your interpretation of that is, because it, it is interesting when you look at the number of Catholic politicians since the early 20th century who have cited Governor Winthrop. Mm -hmm. uh, right. But yeah. it, right. it, so there, there is the sense that that story, you know, when you talk about it, it, it is that shared sort of New England story. It does mm -hmm. sort of relate to that civic culture, but the, the way that it also reflects, a kind of, I think, a distinctive Catholic ethos that has emerged from, from, from Boston. We, we do have time, I think, for one more question. If someone else from the audience would like to, yes, sir. Thank you very much, I've been fascinated. Um, are there spiritual lessons that we can draw from that period, or even lessons that citizens of Boston can draw to make the city a better place today? Hmm. In, in some ways, that is kind of the final question that I was, was going to raise with the panel. And if I could just paraphrase, how does this, the, this legacy of religion in Boston, how, how, are, how is it still informing what we do today? And, and if I could maybe add a nuance to the question, how perhaps have we left aspects of that, like the, the worst parts of that legacy behind? Well, when, I'd like to think that, that Murray Baker Eddy's uh, cooperation with so many different faiths during the 1880s, during her time in the South End, is a nice example for all faiths to think about, that, that she didn't feel that she had to separate herself from the other ministers, even those who were attacking her, that she tried hard to have that sense of, of intersection, shall we say, with the other faiths that were prevalent in, in Boston during that period? Yeah, that's a profound question. Um, I would just say, um, in, in this case, um, I think you know, history of all kinds makes you profoundly humble about your political opinions. And if you had met if you had, you know, if I think, if I had lived in Boston in the 1880s, you know, I might be marching against Catholics, you know, and I couldn't talk to Jim or what, but, you know, and it, and it would have seemed the most natural thing in the world. Um, and so we look back and we say, oh, the, you know, we've progressed so far beyond these benighted, bigoted people, and thank goodness, well, we've just, we have our own stumbling blocks. I say, so in the future, someone would say, 
pro football, they were watching that? <laughs> what oh, barbarians, yeah, so. Uh, it, it is a, a, a profound question. Um, and I guess I'd say this, it used to be possible for historians to think and to write as if the immigration chapter in American history was something that happened and then it ended. Um, and you know, with the passage of uh, restrictive immigration laws in the 1920s, uh, that's certainly the point at which uh, large-scale Catholic, in particular, uh, immig immigration stopped. As I say, it used to be possible for us to think, well, immigration, that used to be a dimension of American history, but it just isn't anymore. Uh, well, we know um, uh, that in recent decades that, that it is. It's obviously a, a very controverted uh, political topic, and I have no more brilliant idea than anybody else uh, as to, uh, as to uh, what the law ought, ought to be. But certainly immigration is still very much a part of the American story. Immigration now not from the various countries of Europe, but from uh, Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, and, uh, and so on. And I think if there's, if there's something we can try to learn from Boston history, where immigration has been uh, such a recurring theme, uh, I think we can try humbly uh, to, uh, to try to learn from what that experience has, has been uh, of immigration and how the city has um, responded. Uh, as, as we try to formulate what our, what our response is going to be now and going forward. I think, Jim, that's a perfect note to conclude <laughs> on. Uh, I want to thank uh, my colleagues on the panel and thank you all very much for your participation this afternoon. <laughs>